or one, two, one, two. This is Scotland Yard. For the first time in its history, Scotland Yard opens its official files to bring you the true stories of some of its most celebrated and baffling cases. These are the true stories. The plain, unvarnished facts, just as they occurred, reenacted for you by an all-British cast. Only the names have, for obvious reasons, been changed. The broadcasts are presented with the full cooperation of Scotland Yard. Research for Whitehall 1212 comes from Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Now you are to hear the voice of the man in charge of Scotland Yard's famous black museum, Chief Superintendent John Davidson. The things we have on display in the black museum are mementos of crime. Murder is the most frequent category. Here among the knives, the guns, the bludgeons, among the vials of poisons and the ropes and cords that have served as murder weapons, is this incongruous object. I'm sure you know what it is. Yes, it's a shoe, the kind known in Britain as a Wellington boot. It's an old-fashioned thing invented by the Duke of Wellington himself. You've seen Wellington boots before. The tragic thing about this one is its small size. It was worn by a ten-year-old child. Here is Chief Inspector John Mackey Marsh of the CID will tell you about Scotland Yard case number 3431198. This is the story of a person who was twice tried for the same murder. In fact, I think this is the only instance of that in the whole history of British jurisprudence. I'll tell you more about it. On the afternoon of the 5th December 1937, in Newark, in Nottinghamshire... A little ten-year-old child left her schoolroom for her home a short distance away. That was the last time she was ever seen alive, except by a few persons who did not recognize her. Her name was Nora Brady. She was the daughter of Jack William Brady, a coal carter, and Maggie Summers Brady, his wife. At about ten that night, when Nora had not returned to her home, the police were notified and inquiries begun. During the night, the following procedures were set in motion. All the other pupils in the school, attended by Nora Brady, were interviewed at home, most of them already abed. Results, nil. All the relatives of the Bradys in Newark were interviewed. Results, nil. All traffic on the Great North Road, which runs through Newark, was screened. Results, nil. Every piece of abandoned and derelict property in a wide radius of Newark was examined. Results, the child is not found. The fruitless inquiries continued all through the night. In the morning, all New York school principals were asked by the police to inquire their pupils whether any of them had seen Nora Brady on the previous evening. Results, one principal reported to me that one of his pupils had seen her. When, I asked. Between half past four and a quarter to five yesterday afternoon, he tells me. Where? Opposite the bus station, he tells me. You are sure he recognized her? He says he did, sir. Was she alone? He says not. Ah. Who was with her, then? He is quite positive. Who? A former lodger of her father's, a man known to him as... Nora's Uncle Ted. Is he her uncle? No, I do not believe so. I'll ask Brady. A little later in the day, when the news of Nora Brady's disappearance had got around the town of New York, a Mrs. Black came forward. I didn't see the little girl, Chief Inspector, but I did see a man waiting near the Wesleyan school she attended. When? At about a quarter to four yesterday afternoon, about 15 minutes before school was dismissed. What was he doing? Just staring at the door of the school, as if he were waiting for someone. Who was he, do you know? Yes, sir. As a matter of fact, I do. I live next door but one to the Brady's. I was the lodger they used to have, the one they threw out, the one that Nora used to call Uncle Ted. And the driver of a bus that runs between Newark and Redford, a small town about 25 miles away. He said he remembered a child with a slovenly middle-aged man on the bus that left Newark at 4.45. He did not know the child, but his description of her clothes corresponded with the dress and coat she was known to have been wearing. But we couldn't find Nora Brady. I talked to her father, Jack William Brady. No, Ted Peters ain't her uncle, sir. He's no relation to any of us. And besides, I threw him out of my house. I didn't want him about. Why? Well, for one thing, sir, he drinks. Oh, great. Many people drink, Mr. Brady. And I enjoy a pint myself after a hard day's work. 
But I'd have no man lying about my house 40% of the time in a drunken stupor and making a beast of himself. Anything else, Mr. Brady? She bloody well say there was anything else. My wife's sister in Sheffield, she and her husband, they introduced Ted Peters to us as a friend of the family. Friend of the family, indeed. He had an old broken-down motor car that he used to drive them about in. That's how great a friend of the family he was. My wife's sister's husband, uh, my brother-in-law, Bert Sickley, he knew this Ted Peters in the RAMC, in the war. So that makes him a friend of the family. And what else? And that's just it, I'm trying to tell you. We let him have a room, turning it into a blinking pigsty he did, never having a bath and sleeping in bed with his boots on and keeping scraps of greasy fish and chips and God knows what else lying about till the, till the very roaches themselves wouldn't eat them and pinching my shorts and using violent, filthy language before my wife and poor little Nora. I chucked him out. And what did he say to that? He swore something fearful till I broke two of his ugly teeth for him and then he slunk away muttering most horrible curses and threatening me uh, how he'd get even with me. Oh, he threatened you? And besides, he never paid me one single farthing of the six shillings a week he owed me all that time. How long? Uh, fifteen ruddy weeks. Six times fifteen, um, ninety shillings. Four pound ten he owed me altogether for rent alone. And my wife and me had to take a bleeding shovel and clean out that pigsty he'd made of our room. And he went away muttering and cursing and threatening us. Is he a relation? My aunt's cat's left hind leg he is. If Ted Peter stole my little Nora, you get her back and at once too, or I'll do it. And I'll bring you back Ted Peter's stinking head in a bucket besides. Did he ever threaten your daughter, Mr. Brady? Little Nora? No, he, he never threatened her. It was me that he... He didn't threaten her? He said something to me about taking the most precious thing I had. I thought it was just talk at first, but he knowed how much I, I thought about Nora. And besides, he seemed to have a kind of a fascination for her. He was always bringing her bits of toffee or cakes or something. He was very good to Nora. Once he gave her a half a crown, but I made her give it back. The child loved him. How can a child love a pig? What's this Uncle Ted business? Some idea. That some, she had some idea that he was connected with my wife's sister and her husband that, that introduced this Ted Peters to us. I see. I think. Do this brother and sister see Ted Peters at all now? She's mixed up in some kind of deal with him. She's got money of her own a little. She's talking to him, she says, about raising the money for him to buy a lorry and go into business. I don't know what kind of dirty business he's going into. Or he wouldn't let him touch the coal that I haul. He'd get it dirty. Go and make him let my kid go. Does Peters live in Redford? Redford? The driver of a Redford bus says he saw a man with Nora yesterday. Hmm? Lives at Hilton. That's on the road to Redford. That's where he's got Nora. You go there and see. I went to Hayton, but I didn't see what Brady had expected me to see. Ted Peters did live in Hayton, and an infinitesimal village not far from the River Idle, which is a part of the network of waterways that lies about nearby Sherwood Forest. Sheffield, where the elder Brady's sister-in-law and her husband lived, is some 50 miles away by most baffling roads. I found Peter's house, which was ingenuously named Peace Haven at a quarter to eight of a windy, rainy winter night. The house was dark, but Peter's lit a lamp and we sat down to talk. I spoke first. When did you last see Nora Brady, Mr. Peters? Who's Nora Brady? You don't know. <coughs> she's sick? You do know. Oh, she's, she's a kid of Brady's in Europe where I used to live. Oh, I know who she is. When did you see her last? Uh, about 15, 16 months ago. Oh? Uh? Hmm. You didn't see her yesterday? Well... Is that what you're saying to me? Well, I saw 15, 16 months ago, sir. There are people who will testify under oath that they saw you with her yesterday. Yesterday. Oh, yesterday. She has not been seen since yesterday. I wonder where she is. You don't know? How on earth would I know? How would I know? Has Nora been here since yesterday? I told you, it's been 15, 16 months ago. Will you answer my question? Has Nora Brady been in this place since yesterday afternoon? No. Would you mind if I search this house? You won't find it. In addition to searching the house, I'll have to search the grounds too, you know. I shall dig up everything. You won't find her here. Where is she? I don't know. But she has been here. <coughs> I don't know where she is now. But she was here. 
Well, she, she wanted to come. Why? Well, <clears throat> yesterday when I was waiting for the bus at Newark... What were you doing in Newark? I was expecting to meet Brady's sister-in-law. She lives in Sheffield. You know, I thought she might be visiting in Newark, visiting the Brady's. She wasn't, though, was she? Why did you want to meet her? Well, she, she, she's going to get me some money to buy me lorry. Oh, I've heard about it. But she wasn't there, we know that. You didn't visit the Brady's to see if she was there, though, did you? <laughs> of course not. Brady hates me. Did you ever threaten Brady? Well, I was indignant when he chucked me out. I know about that too, Peter. All about it, including your threat. Well, then what are you asking me about it for? I'm reminding you that I know. Brady lies. Brady's daughter has been kidnapped. That's not a lie. Are you going to listen to me? With great attention, I assure you. Go on, sir. I was waiting for the bus when this kid comes up. Uh, what's your name? You know her name, Peter. All right. Uh, she says to me, Uncle Ted, she says she always calls me Uncle Ted, are you going to see my Aunt Bernice? That's her father's sister-in-law that lives in Sheffield. What made her think you were going to see her? <sighs> She's a talk often. Well, I says, your aunt's coming to see me. About the money for the lorry. Exactly what I told her, Governor. Get on with it. Well, then, Uncle Ted. She always calls you Uncle Ted. Uncle Ted, she says, take me with you so I can get to see the baby. What baby? Uh, the sister-in-law's got a new baby, three or four months old. She carries with her whatever she goes, you see. And, and that's the baby this Noel who wanted to visit. Yeah. So she asked me if it's her back here, where this lady from Sheffield and the baby was going to be, and... You all consented. You consented. This was at the bus station. Uh, yes, uh, at the bus station. What were you doing at Nora's school at three forty-five? Huh? Oh, oh, she asked me to meet her. Then you did bring her here. Yes. Where is she? <clears throat> I'll have to tell you about that. I'm afraid you will. Uh, this morning. One time. Uh, about half past nine. About half past nine, there's a, a telephone call for me. Where? Eh? Oh, at a house down the road where they let me use their telephone. I haven't got a telephone. Whose house? Uh, Mrs. Lester's, Mrs. Kate Lester's. You could ask her. I shall. Well, it's from this little girl's aunt, and she says she couldn't come today. She couldn't come for another week, and, and here I was with little Nora that wanted to see the baby. What did you do then? Well, I... I told Nora first, and then I told her she, she must go. Back home? Well, I told her she wanted to see the baby, so I gave her an half a crown and started it off for Sheffield to see the baby. <clears throat> well, what's wrong with that? You didn't call her parents and tell them? No. She was going to see her aunt, wasn't she? So you say? Uh, I gave her half a crown. Is half a crown enough to get her to Sheffield? Uh, she'd have to walk a good deal of the way. Then there's the bus. You... Mean to say that you sent a ten year old child out in this weather to walk? Oh, no. What time is this? About noon. When it was raining hardest, when half a gale was blowing. Well, that's why I don't know where she is. She, she might have got lost. You didn't telephone her parents? Of course. Her, her old man would have. Well, where, where are you going, sir? Don't you want to hear any more? Don't, don't you want to find her? No, I don't want to hear any more. Yes, I want to find her. That's why I'm going out and check up on what you've said. You stay right here. I shall want to talk with you when I return. <laughs> where would I go, Governor? I don't know where you'd go, my man. Because there's one of my constables standing outside this door in the rain. You'll certainly not get very far. I spoke to Mrs. Kate Lester, the owner of the telephone down the road. Yes, she knew Ted Peters. He was a frequent user of her telephone. Yes, Mr. Peters had talked on her telephone about half past nine that morning. Yes, she'd overheard him, although Mrs. Lester agreed it's not neighborly to eavesdrop. It was with someone in Sheffield, Mrs. Lester said. Peters seemed to be cancelling an appointment he had had for that same day with someone in Sheffield, which apparently had to do with borrowing money to buy a lorry. Mr. Peters had decided against buying the lorry, he had said. And the person in Sheffield would not need to come and see him at all. And did he mention the name of Nora Brady, I asked Mrs. Lester? Or say anything about a baby? No, said Mrs. Lester. It was all about lorries and not coming to see him anymore. And that was also. 
And when I returned to the Peace Haven cottage, Ted Peters was gone. The light was still on. Nothing appeared to have been taken. The constable at the front door had heard nothing, but Ted Peters was gone. We searched the place from roof to cellar. An extraordinarily filthy place, quite consonant with the tales we'd heard of Peters. There were indications that a child had been there, perhaps even whilst I'd been conferring with Peters. A school notebook, half filled with undecipherable childish scribblings, apparently quite recently done. A child's grubby handkerchief stamped in indelible ink with an N. A half cup of cold cocoa. But of the child, no other sign. And of Peter's, nothing. He returned at ten minutes after two in the morning, his boots muddy and his outer clothing wet from the rain. I called for more constables, and by lantern light we went over every inch of the surrounding fields while Peters watched us silently with no expression at all on his face. At seven in the morning I charged him with the kidnapping of Nora Brady under the offences to the Person Act. Nora Brady was never seen alive again by anybody. Peters was tried at the Warwick Winter Assizes of Birmingham and was sentenced by Mr. Justice Armour to seven years' penal servitude. I shall not forget what the judge said to him as he passed sentence. Ted Peters, you have been, <coughs> most properly in my opinion, convicted by the jury of a dreadful crime. What you did to that little girl, what became of her, only you know. It may be that time will reveal the dreadful secret which you carry in your heart. And Nora Brady was never again seen alive by anyone. <laughs> I had thought I would never have to look on Ted Peters again either. But I saw him again. I'd seen him last in the dead of the worst winter England has had in 17 years. The next time was in balmy midsummer weather in the following June. I have spoken before of the honeycomb of waterways that lies about the Sherwood Forest country. The River Idle is one of the principal of these streams. It flows slowly and peacefully north to the Trent. But near Hayton, where Ted Peters had his home, Peace Haven, there is a short stretch of water called Bolham Shuttle, deep, swift, and unpleasant, a part of the River Idol. On Sunday the 6th, June, 1937, exactly five months and one day after Nora Brady had disappeared from the schoolroom, I was informed that a Donald Palmer, of whom I'd never heard, wished to speak to me on the telephone. I answered. Chief Inspector Marsham... Donald Palmer speaking you from Bottry in Nottinghamshire. I'm afraid I don't know where Bottry is. Do I know you, Mr. Palmer? I'm manager of the gas works at Bottry, Chief Inspector. Yes. Bottry is on the River Idol, Chief Inspector. Yes. Only a short distance below the town of Hayton. Hayton? What's happened now at Hayton? It's not at Hayton, sir. It's Bottry, below Hayton, on the River Idol. Yes. I remember you when that man Ted Peters was arrested. Yes. I thought you might be interested in what I have discovered in the river here, sir. What have you discovered, sir? A dead body, Chief Inspector. A dead body? Yes. A dead... The dead body of a child. A girl about ten years old. I was off post-haste to Bortry. I will not tell you how I got there because I don't remember, and I, I can conceive anyway a few others who would have reason to go there. But there we were. Palmer, the gas works manager, Henry Bernard, the great pathologist from the home office, a gaggle of country constables, me, a brace of newspaper detectives, assorted wives and sons of the gas works men, and in an outhouse of a nearby country in the pathetic little body of the drowned girl. Yes, it was Nora Brady. Jack Brady, her father, had been summoned from Newark and made the tearful identification. He recognized the blue jumper dress she had worn and her brown cloth and the neat cotton underclothing her mother had made her. It was difficult to recognize her otherwise. Adipocere tissue due to long immersion in the water, Henry Bernard said, had set in. But the identification was positive. It was Nora Brady, and she was dead. Only one person was missing, 
uh, we knew where he was. And the coroner's jury was convened. Henry Bernard, the pathologist, testified. No, this child did not die from the effects of drowning. It is true that the body has been immersed in the water for a long time. It's not inconsistent, in my opinion, to say that she has been in the water for at least five months. That is to say, since early January of this year, but she was not drowned. I ask you to observe this mark around the neck. This was caused before death. She was strangled. Could that not have been caused, sir, by the neck of her dress having caught on a low branch above the water? And been suspended by the neck, I presume you mean, sir? Yes, sir. That might... In that case, the mark would have been flat and broad from the neckband of the dress. This one is sharply defined and it is cut into the flesh of the neck. Yes, but... And if the marks were caused by the dress supporting the weight of the body, the marks would have been oblique. You can make such an experiment yourself, sir, and find for yourself... Well, uh... This mark is horizontal all the way around the neck. The child was strangled. But, uh... But what? Well, maybe that happened after she was dead. There is no water in the lungs. I can demonstrate that to you. Yes, sir. And you've seen the marks on the tongue, the marks that correspond with the child's teeth where she bit her tongue. That is a characteristic of strangling or suffocation. They always bite their tongues. Well, but... She couldn't bite her tongue after she was dead, sir. Oh, the child was strangled. There was more talk, but the evidence was incontrovertible. Verdict of the coroner's jury? We, the jury, find that the deceased came to her death through the agency of a person or persons unknown. Now, it was my turn again. I was myself morally certain that the person or persons were not entirely unknown. I could not help reflecting on Mr. Justice Armour's speech to Peters when he sentenced him. What you did to that little girl, what became of her, only you know. It may be that time will reveal the dreadful secret. But it's never well for a policeman to entertain prejudices. The hangman's shadow sometimes grows dim. However... I thought I might journey to the prison where Ted Peters was still serving his seven years. But I was not sure. I was not sure. Then Henry Bernard, the pathologist, brought something into my desk and laid it down before me. I looked at it. It was damp and soggy. It was cracked and twisted. Obviously, it had been in the water a long time. I picked it up. What is it, I asked? It's a Wellington boot, I should say. Wasn't that child wearing Wellington boots when she was last seen? She was. I'll ask her father to look at this and see if he can identify it. She wasn't wearing Wellington boots when that fellow found her body. Wasn't she? She had only her stockings on. All of her clothes except her hat and her Wellington boots. Where'd you get this? The policeman found it. Where? In Bolum Shuttle. Wait. My mind went back to that evening in January. When I left Peters alone to go out and check his story of a telephone call. When I came back, he was gone. Had he been to Bollum Shuttle that cold, stormy night, carrying a body with him? A very small body. That had been hidden in that house until I left. A body that he must get rid of before we searched the place. Would a body, I asked Bernard, float all the way from Bollum Shuttle to the place where hers was found? It could. I remembered Peter's muddy clothes when he came back that night. Could you identify that mud if I found it, I asked Bernard? If I had something to compare it with, yes. Bollum Shuttle. Get me the mud you want to identify and I'll go down to Bollum Shuttle and compare it myself. The mud was on the clothing he was wearing that night last winter. Did he wear those same clothes at his trial? I don't... Yes. Yes, he did. I do remember. He wasn't to prison? That I don't know. If he did, they've still got them at the prison where he is. Do you suppose... 
Of course they are. <laughs> they don't wash prisoners' clothing. They give them new. Well? I'll get your sample. Mail it to me. I'll be at Bollum Shuttle. I went to the prison where Peters was confined. I did not see him, though. My business was with the governor. I showed him sufficient cause, and he gave me Peter's muddy clothing. I posted them to Bernard and sat and waited. Finally, a telephone call was put through from Redford to me. It was a very short one. It wasn't difficult. The mud's identical. And then I went back to the prison and asked to see Ted Peters. To find that Peters had gone over the wall, escaped. I sat there when the governor told me, miserably clutching that kid-sized Wellington boot. The same one the chief superintendent, John Davison, showed you. The one he has in the Black Museum. Oh, we'll find him, said the prison governor reassuringly. We'll find him. I walked out miserably, still clutching the shriveled boot. They did find him, though, a week later. Lurking one night in an abandoned shed near the place in York where Jack Brady was employed. He had a heavy rubber cosh, blackjack you'd call it, and a caliber thirty-two revolver loaded. He was charged by the police with a variety of crimes against the King's Peace and lodged safely in the Newark jail. That's why I saw him a day later. Peters, I said, where were you that night last January when I left you alone in that house at Redford? Peacehaven. Peacehaven. Well, you know. You had Nora Brady in that house hidden all the time I was there. I did, huh? And you carried her to Bollum Shuttle and killed her and dropped her body in the water. You're a liar. She was found, strangled to death. That was way downstream. But we found this in Bollum Shuttle. What's that? Nora Brady's shoe. One of the Wellington boots she was wearing that night. Excuse me, We can prove it is. You can't prove I was at Bonham Shuttle. Oh, yes, we can, Peters. <clears throat> the boot slipped off her foot and I'd have got it, but the water was so cold. So cold for a little girl, too. She didn't feel it. Ted Peters, I arrest you on a charge of willful murder, and I warn you that anything you say will be taken down in writing and may be used in evidence. <laughs> Ted Peters went to his second trial for the same murder. This time at the Nottinghamshire Assizes in the Shire Hall in the city of Nottingham, he was found guilty and sentenced to death. And this time, after the Court of Criminal Appeals had turned their thumbs down, he was hanged at Lincoln Prison. Heard on Whitehall 1212 today, Horace Braham as Inspector Marsh. Others in the order of their appearance, Harvey Hayes, Winston Ross, Beulah Garrick, Gerard Burke, Carl Hobbard, and Lester Fletcher. Lionel Rico speaking. Whitehall 1212 is written and directed by Willis Cooper. Somewhere right at this moment, somebody's home is on fire. If the people who live there are lucky, they've all escaped, the firemen have arrived, and maybe they've even rescued a few odds and ends. Yes, every 20 seconds through the year, a fire breaks out in the United States. These fires kill 11,000 persons each year, disfigure for life, or severely burn thousands more, and destroy $7 million worth of property. Protect your home from fire by following these simple safety precautions. Don't smoke in bed or throw away lighted cigarettes. Clean out closets, any place where old newspapers, magazines, and inflammable materials are liable to accumulate. Repair defective electric equipment and replace worn or frayed wiring. Use cleaning fluids that will not burn. Remember, don't gamble with fire. The odds are against you. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.